I've long wanted to hear a sermon at our church on capital punishment or the death penalty. I've talked to Tom about it a few times, but now that I'm preaching today, you get to hear one. <laughs> this could be about the statistics of capital crimes. In fact, Sister Helen Progen from Louisiana says that capital crime is called such because in a capital crime, if one has the capital, one doesn't pay for the crime. I could speak of the cost of life without parole sentences versus keeping someone on death row and the continued cost of appeals through the courts. I could speak of those innocent people who have been unjustly executed in the name of justice. I could speak of those with the cognitive ability of a preteen who have sat on death row. I could speak of a victim's family which seeks justice yet even after the execution is carried out, their loss is not reduced. I could speak on any or all of these things, but instead I would like to relate two stories to you on how lives intersect and bring us all into the interdependent web of life and how each person deserves to be considered with dignity, even those which society deems beyond worth. The first story occurred April 28, 1982, 35 years ago. I was at work late one afternoon and received a phone call from my wife telling me to go to my friend Wayne's house and to please hurry. I hung up without asking any of the details. I drove for the 15 minutes to his house and when I turned onto his street, my worst fears were realized. There were five or six police patrol cars parked by the house there were many unmarked car, police cars as well. And as I rushed to the house, I met another friend at the door who told me my friend had been murdered in his line of duty as a, on his job as a police officer. He was a plainclothes detective serving an out-of-state felony warrant and had been killed by a person the television news reports described as a mad dog cop killer. Wayne had by news reports and police information, encountered his suspect in the breezeway of an apartment, struggled with the suspect, and had been shot in the back. He tried to run to his car where he collapsed and died. He left behind a wife, two sons, and a beautiful two-year-old daughter. There was a police guard parked in front of the house for the next two days until his killer was caught. My second story occurs on April 28, 1982, 35 years ago. A black man named Arthur Williams was leaving his apartment with a friend. While walking through the breezeway toward the parking lot, a tall white man, 6'2", 230 pounds, dressed in jeans, cowboy boots, a western sh shirt with pearl snap buttons, a cowboy hat, and aviator sunglasses, grabbed him by the collar, shoved him up against the wall of the breezeway and put a gun in his face. The big man shouted, don't move or you're dead. Arthur, thinking he was being assaulted, grabbed the barrel of the pistol, moved it away from his head and during the ensuing struggle, the white man in the Western clothing dropped his gun and turned to reach for it. At this moment, Arthur pulled out a derringer from the back of his pants, cocked the hammer, shot, cocked the hammer, and shot again. The man who had been shot, my friend, ran off. Arthur ran away as well. Arthur Williams was caught two days later, charged with capital murder. He was tried, convicted, and sentenced to death. He has been on death row fighting his conviction of capital murder for the last 35 years. When I first learned of my friend's death, my community was consumed initially with grief. Then anger took over. How could someone take this man's life? How could they take someone's husband? How could he take someone's father? How could he take our friend? After the arrest, everyone wanted quick justice. Only we wanted our version of justice. Wayne's killer was convicted. He was sentenced to death. Yet while he is still on death row, the idea of justice has raised its head to me over and over again. Is killing this man justice? Will his death bring my friend back? 
who is this person that did this? And why has he spent so much time on death row without his sentence being carried out? All the, these are important questions. These are not actually the questions I should be addressing today. So many times we get caught up in life looking in the wrong place for the wrong answers. The questions I should be asking are, what does the profession of my faith require of me? How do I incorporate what I say I believe on one hand with my experiences on the other hand, which seem juxtaposed to one another? In instances such as this, we tend to focus on the other rather than our response to it. Today, I choose to address two of the seven UU principles to examine how my faith might affect how I address difficult issues in life. Some of the sources from which we draw our principles, which are in the front of the hymnal, are wisdom from the world's religions, which inspires us in our ethical and spiritual life, and words and deeds of prophetic women and men, which challenge us to conform powers and structures of evil with justice, compassion, and and the transforming power of love. The first UU principle, the inherent worth and dignity of every person. And the seventh UU principle, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. One of the easier parts of our faith is simply saying that we agree with and observe all seven principles. The difficult part is applying them real time in our day-to-day lives. I say I believe in the inherent worth and dignity of the man who murdered my friend. How can that be? After years of reflection and rehashing this event, the subsequent trial, and the numerous appeals, I find there is, as in most of life, more here than meets one's initial look. The striking of any black jurors from the jury pool only allowing people on the jury who believed in the death penalty, the lack of giving essential evidence to the defense, providing the killer with an attorney who had never in his life tried a capital case are all issues that make the sentence questionable. Now, the verdict is true. My question is the sentence. Sister Helen Prejean, who wrote Dead Man Walking, says people are more than the worst thing they have ever done. Reverend Rebecca Ann Parker, uh, former president of Star King School, says that our, of our first principle, reverence and respect for human nature is at the core of the UU faith. We believe that all dimensions of our being carry the potential to do good. We can use our gifts to offer love, to work for justice, and to heal injury. At our General Assembly in New Orleans a few weeks ago, a couple of UUA staff members were robbed and severely beaten on the street one night in the French Quarter. Our newly elected UUA president, Reverend Susan Frederick Gray, addressed how we should respond with the following. As I have listened to Unitarian Universalists reflect on this situation, I have been moved by the connections made to Brian Stevenson's powerful message to us at General Assembly that simply punishing the broken, walking away from them or hiding them from sight only ensures that they remain broken and we do too. There is no wholeness outside of our reciprocal humanity. May we hold the young adults who carried out the robbery with the universal love that we hold the victims. This is so very important. Many voices have lifted up hope for a process of restorative justice. These are our Unitarian Universalist values calling us to live in the reality of the heartbreak of our world. While remembering that no one is outside of the circle of love, that compassion is always our guide. And that as a religious community, we seek the well-being of all people and the dismantlement of systems of oppression that undermine our collective humanity. I ask myself, 
How can this man who killed my friend carry the potential to do good? What gifts does he have to offer love, to work for justice, and to heal injury? Again, how do we as a community apply our beliefs to the hard questions of life? We all have people we know with whom we struggle to acknowledge their worth and their dignity. Yet that is our very first principle. In my case, this man, Arthur, has been for the last 35 years making the justice system face up to its shortcomings, face up to presenting less than all the facts to his attorney prior to his trial, face up to his court, making them face up to a court-appointed inadequate lawyer who now, by the way, is a very good attorney in Houston. He was simply inexperienced. As Danny sang, my court-appointed lawyer couldn't look me in the eye. He stood up and closed his briefcase as they sentenced me to die. I had to work to find out both sides of this story and find my own place of where I believe the truth is. I had to work on my faith. And here, I make a comment that this work also involves our fourth principle, which I hadn't even included, a free and responsible search for the truth. Is the dignity and worth of an individual governed by the date of drug used in execution, rushing, rushing the executions of human beings to suit the expiration dates stamped on lethal drugs defines precisely a society and moral collapse. The next principle I want to examine in the light of the death penalty is the seventh, the interdependent web of all existence. A little bit of a lighter story uh, on this, on how things we can encounter may be crossing our paths further down the line. Mary Beth and I rented a cottage in Boone for our anniversary last April. Next to this college, cottage was a stream probably about 20 or 30 feet wide and about a couple of feet deep which it turns out was called East, East Fork. I became curious about where it went and followed it on a map. This East Fork flows into the South Fork New River. That in turn flows into the New River, which flows north through Virginia and West Virginia and joins the Ohio River. As you know, the Ohio River flows to the Mississippi. The Mississippi flows south to the Gulf of Mexico where the Gulf Stream takes the water into the Atlantic Ocean. The end of October, the 1st of November, Mary Beth's job takes her to Key West, where I hope to meet her for a few days of R&R. &R. And I thought six or seven months is not very long, but at some point, I may be able to go to Key West and wade in some of the same waters that we saw flowing past our cottage in April. Now, how do we know when and where those things we encounter which contribute to who and what we are, will cross our paths again. How do we know what influence these things or people will have on us or maybe others? What I share today from my life 35 years ago may influence you in your social or spiritual life and practice. Where down the line might we each wade in waters we encountered years ago and might invite others to wade in and share with us? Part of the seventh principle, in my opinion, is to be sure in times of spiritual conflict or distress that we don't focus on what that other one has done in what we consider to be an offense, but focus on our response to it. We need to remember, as Viktor Frankl, a Holocaust survivor, said, what is to give light must endure burning. My personal view on capital punishment in the light of these two principles requires me to slow down with my quick judgments and examine what has taken place. Does an execution carry out justice? Does it improve our society? Does the killing of one person justify making the executioner, along with our society, murderers as well? Those executed, by the way, have the cause of death on their death certificates listed as homicide. An eye for an eye? What about interrupting this cycle? Do criminals deserve punishment 
Certainly, yes, of course they do. But what does an execution do to improve our society or stop further crimes of this nature? In my opinion, nothing. I'd like to end with this short essay by Andrew Boyd titled, The Agony of Being Connected to Everything in the Universe. Many of us have set out on the path of enlightenment. We long for a release of selfhood in some kind of mystical union with all things. But that moment of epiphany, when we finally see the whole pattern and sense our place in the cosmic web, can be a crushing experience from which we never fully recover. Compassion hurts. When you feel connected to everything, you also feel responsible for everything. You cannot turn away. Your destiny is bound to the destinies of others. You must either learn to carry the universe or be crushed by it. You must grow strong enough to love the world yet empty enough to sit down at the same table with its worst horrors. To seek enlightenment is to seek annihilation, rebirth, and the taking up of burdens. You must come prepared to touch and be touched by each and everything in heaven and hell. I am one with the universe, and it hurts. Each person on this earth has their own story, even if they get lost somehow. May we go forward and support one another in our struggles and victories of living our faith in such a harsh, beautiful world. Amen.